prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in your secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all oh, you who hope in the Lord. Let's pray. You know, Father, sometimes when we use the word hope, we use it as though we wish something would happen, and yet... The biblical word for hope means more than that. It means an expectation because of our confidence in you. We have the hope of eternity with you, Lord. Not something that might happen, but it's something we can expect to happen because of Jesus. And Lord, we are gathered here today as Jesus' people. We gather here because of him. His blood has covered our sins. And we stand before you righteous because of Jesus. We stand before you clothed in the righteousness of your son. We thank you for your presence among us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, that he would minister to people's hearts. That you would do the work through him that only you can do. And I pray, God, that you would set a guard over my lips and I would speak those things that are right and true and that you'd be exalted among us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes it isn't easy to hold on to faith in the midst of a broken world. And that's because the world really is broken. And sometimes the brokenness is so extreme that it's hard to make out the reflection of God in any of it. How do you speak about the goodness of God to a man who's just been diagnosed with an untreatable cancer? Or to parents who've just lost a child? Or a woman who just found out that her husband is divorcing her? Speaking about the goodness of God at times like that really is a statement of faith because God doesn't seem very good when life's collapsing around you. Either that or maybe he's not in control. And yet the Bible repeatedly proclaims both of those truths about God. That God is good, that he knows how to give good gifts to his children, and that God is so in control of everything that not even a sparrow falls from the sky apart from his will. Two truths about God that sometimes seem to be in conflict and often seem contradicted by what we see and experience in the world, which is why faith is a non-negotiable when it comes to living in a broken world. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible tells us. And I suppose that's because without faith, it's hard sometimes to even believe in a God, or at least to believe the truth that the scriptures reveal about him. Here's actually the complete quote from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, I mean, why would you come to God unless you believe there was a God, right? And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That there's some benefit in coming to know him. In the face of the hurt, the suffering, the injustice, the violence, the unanswered questions that are part of life in a broken world, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In spite of indications in our life, or in our world, to the contrary.
contrary. And that's the faith that David is communicating to us in these verses from Psalm 31. Because you see, this psalm wasn't written by a man whose life was free from problems. A man who trusted in God's goodness because he never experienced life's brokenness. If you know anything about David's life, you know that much of his life was filled with struggle. Some of his own making, much of it not. This psalm was written during one of those difficult times. If you go back to verse 9, you hear David talking about it. Have mercy on me, O Lord, he writes, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief, yes, my soul and my body. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I am a, I'm a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I'm forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel, for I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. And yet still David is able to write in verse 19, Oh, how great is your goodness, which you've laid up for those who fear you, which you prepare for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. And I want you to notice the future-oriented focus in David's words when he talks about the goodness of God in this verse. He talks about God's goodness being laid up for those who fear you, for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. The ultimate manifestation of God's goodness is being pictured here as a treasure that's being added to as we're living our life and that we're going to experience one day. It's a goodness that's being laid up. But that day isn't now. It's out in the future that we're going to realize the benefit. That's why David says it's being laid up. It's continuing to accumulate and draw interest as we continue to live out our faith in God in the presence of the sons of men. And you know why it is so important that we do live out our faith in the presence of the sons of men? It's because they're watching us. Many people aren't sure whether there's a God or not, but if he is there and he's real and we claim to know him, then they expect to see some evidence of that God in our lives. And so they're watching. They're learning their theology from the way we live. Our lives are, in a sense, an apologetic for God. Aristotle said there were three ways in which a person could be convinced of the truthfulness of a proposition. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos is the content of the proposition. The facts of which you're attempting to persuade the listener. Pathos is the passion with which the speaker presents and seems to believe the proposition. And ethos refers to the life of the persuader. Does his life back up the belief that he's proposing his truth? All three are important when we're seeking to lead people to faith in Christ. In regard to Logos, the message we're communicating has to have an intellectually defensible content. Christianity is based on the historical reality of a man named Jesus who lived a sinless life died on the cross as payment for the sins of the world and was physically raised from the dead on the third day as confirmation that his sacrifice for sin was acceptable. These are not simply propositions that Christians claim to believe apart from factual support. They are defensible and provable so far as any historical event is defensible and provable. Amen. In fact, the four Gospels have as their intent the sharing with us of historical events that are meant to convince people of the truth claims about Jesus. As the Apostle John writes in chapter 20, verse 31 of his gospel, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John wrote his gospel in order to persuade. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Peter tells us, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables, when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
The truth claims of Christianity are in fact so historically defensible that one skeptic after another who has set out to do his research and disprove Jesus as Son of God and Savior has ended up acknowledging Jesus as Son of God and Savior. One of those, the great Oxford professor and author C.S. Lewis wrote, You must picture me alone in that room, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, and the work he's talking about there was the work he was doing trying to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. Lewis was an expert on ancient documents. He was a PhD at Oxford University on ancient documents. So he was comparing the ancient documents that Christianity has in the Gospels with the ancient doc documents he studied before to try to disprove their validity. So he says, you must picture me alone in that room night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly did not want to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant Christian convert in all of England. So for those who are willing to honestly search the historical content behind the truth claims of Christianity, the evidence can be overwhelmingly persuasive. But let's face facts. Most people who don't know Jesus are unwilling to do the research or even read books in which the research is presented. And that's because the real problem is not so much that they can't be convinced to believe in Jesus as that they want to continue in their sin. In Romans, the Apostle Paul says that it's because of man's desire to continue in sin that he ignores the truth. You see, it's convenient not to believe in a God. It's, to conven it's convenient to not believe you're going to answer for your life one day because then you can do whatever you want. Supposedly, that's especially true of our postmodern world in which any truth claim is challenged. Pathos, the passion for what we believe, and ethos, the changed lives that our belief produces, have always been important, but perhaps they are never more important than they are today. If God truly is real, and we claim to know Him, people expect to see some evidence of that God in our lives. After Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, there were many Christians who continued to live sacrificial and life-transforming faith. But there were also many who simply called themselves Christians because that was now the official religion of the empire. If you were a Roman, you were a Christian. Just as before, if you were a Roman, you believed in Zeus or Diana. Or... So here's what the early Christian theologian and pastor Augustine wrote about the mixed messages that the Christians of his day were sending to the surrounding cultures. On the lintel above the door of a church in Numidia was written, This is the door of the Lord, the righteous shall enter in. However, Augustine wrote, the man who enters is bound to see drunkards, misers, tricksters, gamblers, adulterers, fornicators, people wearing amulets, assiduous clients of sorcerers and astrologers. He must be warned that the same crowds that press into the churches on Christian festivals also fill the theaters on pagan holidays. It's only love that distinguishes the children of God from the children of the devil because they all make the sign of the cross and answer amen and sing hallelujah. They all go to church and build up the walls of the basilicas to take away the barrier afforded by the laws and men's brazen capacity to do harm. Their urge to self-indulgence would rage to the full because they love the sheer sweet taste of sinning. They don't understand what it means to be a Christian. So give me a man in love. He knows what I mean. Give me one who yearns. Give me one who's hungry. Give me one far away in the desert who's thirsty and sighs for the spring of the eternal country. Give me that sort of a man. He knows what I mean. But if I speak to a cold man, he just doesn't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't know what it means to be a Christian. 
You know what all these things say? He's talking about the importance of pathos and ethos in our lives as Christians. It doesn't matter how historically supportable are the truth claims of Christianity. If people don't see evidence that this Savior we claim to know is making some actual difference in our lives, their minds and their hearts will remain unchanged. People who don't know Jesus need to see some evidence that we who claim to know Jesus truly believe in a God who's real and a God who's good, a God whom we love and in whom we find joy, even in the middle of a broken world. So how do we evidence our faith in the goodness and sovereignty of God, even as we experience the brokenness of our world? Well, one evidence of that trust in God's goodness and sovereignty is the peace that God gives in the face of life's brokenness. For those who continue to hold on to their confidence that God is good and that he's in control, despite what life throws against them, David writes in Psalm 31, verse 20, You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. Now I want you to notice here, and this is extremely important, that David does not tell us that God eliminates suffering and hardship in our lives as believers. The plots of men are still mentioned in verse 20. The strife of tongues is still there. In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus told us. Remember the word that I said to you, Jesus reminded the apostles in John 15, 20. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So being a Christian doesn't mean that you're suddenly removed from the brokenness of the world. One day in the future, we will be removed from the injustice and suffering of our world. One day, those who truly know God will experience the life we yearn for now. But that day is not now. That's not what David's talking about in verses 20 and 21. So what is he talking about if he's not talking about God protecting believers from life's brokenness? He's talking about the peace that God gives. A peace that comes from the assurance that God's still good and that God's still in control even in the midst of the brokenness. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. The picture here is of someone who's been placed in a storm shelter while a storm is raging outside. They're in a place of calm in the midst of chaos. The storm is still there. The chaos is still there. But they're in a place of peace. Peace I leave with you. Jesus told his disciples, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. See, from the world's perspective, peace means you can't have any problems. You're only at peace if everything's going well in life. That's not the kind of peace Jesus said he came to give us. He came to give us a peace even in the midst of the problems, even when the storm's raging, even when the world's collapsing around us, we can still be a people who have peace. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, Jesus said. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. That's the secret place in which David writes in verse 20. The pavilion, the marvelous kindness of God in a fortified city that he tells us about in verse 21. One of my cousins died of cancer several years ago, and I spoke with her shortly after she had learned about the results of the biopsy, and it wasn't good at all. I mean, she only had a short time to live, and they basically told her there was nothing they could really do. And she said when she first learned the results of the biopsy, her first thought was, well, maybe they messed my results up with somebody else's. But she said as soon as that thought came into her mind, she realized that's not a very nice way to think. 
And I would wish, want to wish this on someone else. If I don't want this to be true of me, why should I hope it might be true of someone else instead of me? And then she talked about how she knew that God was in control and that he loved her. And she was going to trust him during this time. And of course, you might think, well, that's easy to say right after you hear the results of a biopsy, but what about when all the suffering starts? What about when the healing doesn't come? Well, in the months that followed, she continued to have that same constancy, that same peace. And by the way, this was a, a person who had not experienced a lot of difficulties in her life before this, in her relationship with her husband, and as she was growing up as a child, and there were lots of struggles that she'd gone through, and this was yet just another, and yet there was peace. She was, I mean, to be around her, she lifted her spirits. I spoke with my cousin <coughs> after she passed away, and he told me that the day before she passed away, he was talking with her. He was sitting by her bed, and he asked her, you know, why does God let us come into this world where we just experience suffering and pain? And she answered him, I think God lets us come into this world and experience all we experience so that we might find our way to him. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in the pavilion from the strife of tongues. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that this kind of supernatural peace is always the first emotion that floods into our hearts. That's really the first reaction we have to whatever shard of life's brokenness cuts into us. And David experienced the same thing. He says in verse 22, I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before your eyes. So that's how David felt initially. That God wasn't with him. That God wasn't hearing his prayers. That God didn't seem to care. And if you'll read some of Abraham's prayers and Moses's and Jeremiah's and Job's, read Jesus' prayers in Gethsemane, you'll see a similar heart cry. Where are you, God? Don't you know what's happening to me? Our first reaction to life's brokenness is to wonder where God is in the midst of everything. Is he paying attention? Does he really know what's happening? Does he even care? I said in my haste, David writes, I'm cut off from your eyes. But then look at what the reality was. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. God was listening to him. God did care. What father is there, Jesus said, whom if his son asked him for a fish would give him a serpent? Or if his son asked him for a piece of bread would give him a stone? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good things to those who ask Him? God is never ignorant as to what's happening in our lives. Nor is He unmoved by the tragedies that afflict us. Nor is He unable to act. But there are some things for which we don't have eyes to see yet, nor hearts to understand. And so in God's goodness, he gives us the grace to rest in him during those times. Cast all your care upon him, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, for he cares for you. Be anxious for nothing, Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what's David's closing counsel to us in Psalm 31, verse 23? Oh, love the Lord, all you his saints. For the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. And basically what David's telling us here, and he tells us this in multiple psalms, is that when the difficult days come, we need to keep hanging in there.
God's going to see to it that everything is set right one day. And one day, you will understand what you don't understand now. Until that day, keep trusting God. Keep loving Him. And He will give you the strength to make it through. Let's pray. I don't know what your personal struggles are. I don't know the storms that are currently going on in your life. Maybe it's because of what you're experiencing personally. Maybe it's because of people that you love and what they're going through. Maybe you're troubled by everything that's happening in our nation right now. All the chaos and hatred and violence. God is not ignorant of what's happening in your personal life, in the lives of people you love, in the life of our nation. God is not ignorant of what's happening. And he knows how you feel. And he's not in a place where he's unable to act. God's always moving for good. But that movement almost always takes time. God works in his time, not ours. And there are lots of reasons for that. Sometimes it's not at the place that we need to be. Sometimes it's because other people aren't at the place they need to be. Sometimes it's because it's not even about us. It's about something else that God's doing. But our job during those times when the difficulties come is to hang in there and trust Him. There's no room in the life of a Christian for hopelessness. There's no room in the life of a Christian for despair. You're a child of God. He gave his own son for you. Jesus poured out his life on the cross for you. So take a few moments and talk with God. Ask him to hide you in that secret place, to keep you secretly in that pavilion while the storms are raging around you. For you to have that place of refuge and peace. And while you're talking to God about those things, maybe you're with us today and you haven't yet come to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Bible tells us there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. There's no other Savior but Jesus. And so if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want to live forever with God and his people, it can only come through Jesus. Your faith in Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're not sure where you stand with God, but you want salvation, you want forgiveness, you want the hope of forever with God, you want a relationship with Him that begins right now and the not even death has the power to end, if you raise your hand, I will lead you in prayer for you. I'll pray the words aloud. You can repeat them silently to God right where you are. All you need to do is raise your hand. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning. I pray, God, that you speak peace into their hearts. The world's broken for every one of us. 
None of us gets out without being cut by it. And when the struggles come, when the suffering comes, it's difficult, Lord. But your son knows what it means to suffer. Your son knows what it means to be betrayed by people whom he loves. Your son knows what it means to be rejected. To have all kinds of bad things said about him. Lord, there's nothing we ever go through that our Savior can't have empathy with us. Lord, I pray for comfort. I pray for encouragement. And I pray for our nation, God. I pray that you move to bring healing. The New Testament tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so wherever you see violence and anger and hatred, you're seeing demonic activity behind it. And there's much demonic activity at work in our nation right now that's attempting to take the wrongs that have been done to others and use them as justification for other wrongs. Father, there are evil people seeking to foment hatred and violence and division. And again, Lord, you're not ignorant of any of this. We know we can trust you in the middle of it. We know that you're working to bring good through this. We also know that the enemy is working to bring evil. But some people are working to accomplish evil. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would take those things that they are doing with the intent to bring evil. And I pray that you would use those things to bring good. I know you're always about that work, Lord. And in the middle of the storm, however long it lasts and however destructive it is, help us to trust you. Hide us, O oh Lord, in that secret place. Help us to have peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to know more about us, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.